Okay, tell you whenever you're ready. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so, hello everybody. Hello. Thank you very much for coming uh, on this rather grim evening to listen to this rather grim subject. <laughs> um, because it is a grim subject in many respects, uh, we could say that the 20th century was an awesome century. It was even, some people have said, an apocalyptic century. Huge. A century of huge events. Um, many of them quite awesome. But it was the century in which all of us were born. And perhaps you have asked yourself, why was I born in the 20th century? Why in this time and this place, in this particular awesome and apocalyptic century? And I've been very interested in trying to understand what was the nature of the 20th century because clearly in the middle of the 20th century we see the events of the Second World War and out of the Second World War came the Cold War and then the various things that have happened since then. But the Second World War itself, in many ways, we can say, came out of the First World War. <coughs> so the First World War, as it were, produced the Second. Or we could say that the First World War was a crucible of the... The First World War was the crucible of the Second. The crucible of something which almost gives birth, although in this case it's not a very pleasant birth, to the, to the um, Second World War and the Cold War. So the subject tonight is British responsibility in 1914 and its relation to our current world situation. And um, the gentleman you see here, uh, does anybody know who this is? Sir Edward Grey, yes. He was the foreign minister who took Britain into the First World War and so he was responsible for British foreign policy. And in those days, it was different from today, because in those days, um, many men who were in the government were either upper, well, they were mostly upper class people, some of them were aristocrats, like him, who came from very old families. So in his case, his family goes back in England to the Norman conquest, so a thousand years. So he comes from a family with deep roots um, in Britain and his family have been, we could say, um, thinking that they were one of the families which was responsible for the nation because that's what aristocrats did for thousands of years. They felt, well, there is the king, and then around the king, there is the aristocracy, there are the aristocrats, which means noble blood. The blood of the father and the son, and so on, this goes down through generations. And they felt that the country belongs to us, it's our country. And the rest of the people are basically our servants. But the country is us. We are the country. And the country really, um, in that sense, was guided for centuries by people like him. And this was still the case in 100 years ago, in 1900, although things were beginning to change at that time. Slowly beginning to become a bit more democratic. And indeed, at the end of the First World War, his um, kind of family and its power was really considerably diminishing, growing smaller. So life became much more difficult for these aristocratic families after the First World War. Um, 
So Sir Edward Grey then, this very uh, old traditional family, and in those days, because these people were a very small group, and they all went to the same school together, or the same schools, I should say, the same schools, um, they were in the same universities, they went to the same, or they joined perhaps the same army regiments, they, went, they were members of the same um, Freemasonic lodges. So they lived in a sort of small group, a small atmos social atmosphere. They belonged to the same gentlemen's clubs. Um, they knew each other. It was a small world. And because it was a small world, because they knew each other, they, in those days, foreign policy in the government was left to, for example, somebody like him. Today, in Britain, and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland too, foreign policy, the prime minister is more active, the teacher could be more active. Um, but in those days, foreign policy in Britain was left, for example, to him. And, well, you get on with it. That's your responsibility. We trust you to get on with it because you are a gentleman. And this was still the age of the English gentleman. And so he was trusted to do that, and he was regarded by his the people around him, for example, in the parliament, he was regarded as a gentleman's gentleman. So when the English gentleman looked at him making, making a speech in the houses of parliament, they felt, this is really one of us, this is one of our best representatives speaking, because he seemed to be so straight, so direct, so um, reserved. He seemed to have all the characteristics which an English gentleman is supposed to have. However, he had another side to it, um, as many English gentlemen of that time did. <laughs> Uh, and we'll see what that was later on. Because although on the surface he seemed to be this straightforward, honest person, actually his actions contradicted his words in many ways. And so we find that in 1914 he took the country into the war and by taking England, Britain, into the war Really, the war became not only a European war, but it became a world war. Because to begin with, it was a European argument between two countries. Austria-Hungary and Serbia. Serbia today, Yugoslavia, part of, well, it was in Yugoslavia until the 1990s, um, in the Balkans. Um, but to begin with then a European war, but when Britain entered the war, it became a world war. And that also meant that it became a slow war. Because wars are fought by different countries according to their characteristics of their nations. It's not an accident that the word, we have the word in English, Blitzkrieg, lightning war is a German word. Why? Because the Germans like to make war fast. Fast in, fast out, finish. But that's not how the British have traditionally made war. The British make war in a different way because they have a different national character. So the British way of making war is not lightning war, but it is slow and steady and it takes time. And that's partly because the British have depended particularly on their navy. And if you depend on your navy to make war rather than the army, that means you, for example, make an economic blockade of your enemy. So you starve your enemy to death. And you undermine your enemy's economy. And this takes time. But that is more in harmony, so to speak, with the more phlegmatic, slow-moving British character than the rather fast, direct German, more choleric 
character, we could say. So war reflects a nation's national character. So when Britain comes in with its navy, which in 1914 was the biggest in the world, that meant war was going to take time, as it did. Now, I'd just like to show you something about the present situation which we have um, in Britain, because things have changed quite a bit in recent years. There's a big argument going on at the moment. A big argument amongst the historians in the English-speaking world and about the nature of the First World War. Uh, the British government decided two years ago that they would spend 50 million pounds on all of the events to remember the First World War, official, public events. And the BBC are putting on the biggest single project on any one single thing that they have ever put on in their long history. And this is going to continue for four years until 2018. So you can see from that how important the British government and the British establishment, the elite of Britain, how important they think this is, that they are going, they're spending all this effort and all this money on remembering the First World War. That shows us they think it's important. And here uh, we see the some of the various historians, some of them, these are the, in the English speaking world, um, although Luigi Albertini is in Italian, but his works are of course translated. Um, these are, I would say, some of the main historians who have written on this, on the First World War. And it's interesting to see that the views which the British government are now, and the BBC, are now giving to the people are, I would say, very one-sided for the most part. And that was not always the case. So until about the mid-1990s in Britain, the views of the First World War, why did it begin, who started it, who was responsible, um, were rather more evenly balanced until the mid-90s, approximately. But after the mid-90s, we see that gradually the balance begins to shift to one side. So about 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, around the time of 9-11, then you find that many of the academic university uh, historians in the English, Anglo-American world, English-speaking world, they were pointing a finger very much at Germany and Austria-Hungary as responsible for starting the First World War. Um, and so these are some of those people here on the right. See some of, beginning with some of the older ones. One of the German historians, Fritz Fischer, was very uh, influential in the 1960s. And, and then coming down to more modern people today. Um, Zara Steiner was one of the main historians of the foreign policy in the Foreign Office. And then we come into these historians today. Um, down here, all of these people. And all of these basically share the same perspective today. And their perspective became a kind of rather tight consensus about 10 to 15 years ago that basically it was Germany and Austria-Hungary who were responsible for starting this war. Now that was of course also the view in 1914 and 1919. It was the view at the beginning of the war, it was the view at the end of the war in English-speaking countries. And at the end of the war, as I'm sure you know, there was the peace treaty, which was held in France, in Versailles, in the Hall of Mirrors of, of uh, King Louis XIV, uh, who had built this magnificent Hall of Mirrors, rather interesting, yeah? 
the mirror, of course, can give you a reflection, but sometimes reflections can be truthful, and other times they can be distorted. Um, anyway, 10 to 15 years ago, these people, their view was dominant, we can say, in the English-speaking world. And these are all highly prestigious people, some of them Oxford, Cambridge historians. And then in this year, which is the 100th anniversary, we have seen um, BBC, famous in England, BBC people like Jeremy Paxman and Michael Portillo and uh, um, making TV programs, radio programs. We've had politicians like Michael Gove, who's in the government, and Boris Johnson, who's the mayor of London. All of them making official statements about the First World War. All of them basically saying Germany was responsible. Uh, this man, Max Hastings, um, let's see what he if I can find his, where I got his pick, yeah. Max Hastings here, that's him. His book, Catastrophe, published 2013. So this book said that the evidence is overwhelming that Austrian Germany must accept principal blame for the outbreak. And he said it's vital to the free, it was, it was vital to the freedom of Europe that the Kaiser's Germany should be defeated. And he also said that World War I and World War II are basically the same, except for the Jewish genocide. Which is quite a big play, if you think about it. So in other words, Britain was right to fight in 1914, just as right in 1914 to fight as, as Britain was in 1939. Um, the same thing except for the Jewish genocide. That's his view. And Max Hastings is a right-wing, conservative, uh, military historian with um, family connections to MI6, uh, deeply a member of the British establishment. It's just interesting to notice that his book, Catastrophe, is the book which you will find in all the bookshops right across the country. So if you go to look for a book explaining the origins of the First World War, this is the book you will find on the shelves. Um, whereas, uh, this man here, Christopher Clark, um, a couple of years ago he wrote this book, I didn't bring it because it's pretty heavy, you might think. <laughs> uh, he wrote this book called The Sleepwalkers. And in this book, he, we can see that he is a representative of a new trend of writing about the First World War. And he's basically saying, well, we cannot say that one country or even two countries were responsible. We can't point the finger at this country or that country. We can say, in fact, that everybody was responsible. All the countries were uh, responsible. It was a European problem. You could even say perhaps that all of Europe was sick and that all of these countries were sick in some way and the politicians and the statesmen were sick and they all therefore contributed because they all had the same sickness. Yeah? And I would say from my perspective there's truth in that uh, because the sickness that European countries had was, well, we could say it was at root, one thing, and the sickness was materialism. And that sickness, which interestingly, of course, the word materialism is related to mother, matter. Yeah? The word, English word matter is related to the Latin word mater, which means mother. So materialism is a philosophy which believes that only matter is real. So if you think, well, you have only your mother, the earth mother, only that which is physical, is real. And this mother is unfortunately not such a pleasant mother and she gives birth to some not very pleasant children and some of those children for example are nationalism, chauvinism, fascism, communism. And all of these isms come out of materialism, capitalism is another one. Communism, capitalism big problem in the 20th century, but really they have the same mother. And um, many of the European countries, well all of them in fact, shared this philosophical perspective. Social Darwinism, another 
materialism, which comes from materialism, but the child, if you like, of materialism. Social Darwinism, the ideas of Charles Darwin applied to society. In, this, in the latter second half of the 19th century. So that led very easily to the notion that nations have to compete against each other. They have to fight against each other. And therefore, some nations must win, and some nations must lose, and some nations are superior, and other nations are inferior. Yeah? And this leads, of course, on to racism. Some races are better than others. These kind of ideas were everywhere in European society at that time. So, um, I would say that because of those isms which filled the minds even of educated people in those days, and people therefore in government, uh, Clark is basically saying that European society was all responsible for the war. And he says, in the, in the situation of 1914, we cannot find somebody or some government or some country which was like a criminal, like a, with a smoking gun standing over the dead body on the ground. You, you can't find this. And he says, the evidence does not support this idea. The evidence does not support the note, the idea that one country was responsible. But it's always the case that historians, usually, tend to focus only on a certain body of evidence. So you can look at all this evidence, or you can look at this evidence. And when Clark says, Christopher Clark, when he says the evidence does not support the idea that one country is responsible, that's because the evidence which he has looked at in his book, which is a good book in many respects, but the evidence which he has looked at is too narrow. So he's not looked in various places where he could have looked, and as a result, he comes to his conclusion. Max Hastings, who I showed you before, he looks in an even narrower place. He looks, in fact, at the place where English Anglo-American historians have always looked, namely Berlin and Vienna, and a bit London. Yeah, would, would you like us to wait till the end to ask questions? Or? Yeah, I think, okay. yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, this narrowing of focus leads to a certain conclusion. And these are some of the historians on the other side of the, of the argument. Um, these two are American historians in the 1920s and 1930s. And they really came to a somewhat similar conclusion to Clark. They were disagreeing with the people who said that Germany and Austria-Hungary are responsible. Um, they were saying, well, the British were also responsible. The French, the Russians. Because, of course, in the war, there was Britain and France and Russia together. Yeah? And on the other side, there was Germany and Austria-Hungary and later Turkey together. So these two groups, right? these three against these three. Brit uh, Britain, Russia, France against again, Germany, Austria-Hungary and um, Turkey. And then we come into the modern period. Um, this historian here, A.J. Morris, I'll show you his book, a picture of that later on. Very good for understanding the use of propaganda before the war. He's based at the University of Ulster, where he was in the 1980s when he wrote his excellent book, The Scaremongers. And then we come down to more, more modern books today. So here we've got Christopher Clark and then Sean McMeekin. Well, he produced a book recently called July 1914. And he's again very strongly disagreeing with. Max Hastings, because he's basically saying in this book and in another book he wrote called The Russian Origins of the First World War, he's emphasizing, well, in fact, if you look at the Russian situation, you can see that it was particularly the Russians who were responsible for the First World War. Well, that's very interesting. 
because, as I said, until recently, Anglo-American historians did not look there. Because he can read Russian, and not all Anglo-American historians can read Russian or Cyrillic languages, languages written in the non-Latin script, yeah? because he can read those languages, um, uh, he, can, he can see the Russian, how Russia was involved. So he comes to a very different conclusion. He emphasizes, he stresses the Russian uh, responsibility in the war. However, um, until recently, hardly anybody has looked at the British responsibility. Was Britain, in fact, the country that was most responsible for the war? Now, until now, the Anglo-American -histor Anglo historians have, of course, said, oh, no. Yeah, because, as I said, the Anglo-American historians have looked mostly at, at Berlin and Vienna. But recent, recent years, we find other historians um, who have looked at the, the involvement of the British in the First World War. John Cafferty. Uh, is an Irishman, um, Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. Uh, John Cavity's book, this one, Lord Milner's Second War. The Rhodes Milner Secret Society, the origins of World War One and the start of the New World Order. And this one, which I would say has a rather sensationalist title and a rather sensationalist cover. But some of the content inside is not at all sensationalist. Some of it is problematic. But others, there's a lot of interesting material they bring forward. And this, this is Doherty and McGregor, Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War. Um, so these two books are looking particularly at the uh, um, the British situation. And then we find uh, two, if I mentioned two other books, one which came out way back in 1949, which I think is really very important for anybody to, to read who is interested in the history of the 20th century, is the Anglo-American establishment by the American historian Carol Quigley. He was based at Georgetown University. He died in the 1970s. Um, this was written in 1949. And he's studying the whole network of the British elite in the first half of the 19th, uh, sorry, of the 20th century from about 1891, from the 1890s onwards. And he's showing you, particularly through various connections of individual people, how the various members of the British establishment worked together, who knew who, who did what with who, what groups they made together, what steps they took in foreign policy, and so on. So this is a very important document, I think. And then, right recently, um, so those are some, these are some of the, the books, I would say, uh, which differ from the Germany Austria-Hungary view. So these are some of the books that I mentioned which um, are looking in other places. And this is more recent. More recent. Except Wilson, this one here, The Policy of the Entente, excellent book, 1980s. Um, K. M. Wilson, he, he doesn't, he perhaps stays a little bit in the background, as he's an active university academic. But this is a really, I think, a very uh, excellent book, the, the Policy of the Entente. Um, and in 1998, the uh, Oxbridge historian Niall Ferguson, Neil Ferguson, wrote his The Pity of War, which was one of the few books at that time which disagreed with the consensus. So this book was really saying um, it was a big mistake that the British made to get involved in the First World War, and he stressed the British responsibility in the First World War. Then Clark, as I mentioned, McMeekin's two books, 
and Kathy and Dr. T. Most recently.